Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome to another Behind the Brand Creator Consult Creator Consulting Session Q and A, whatever you want to call it. Happy Friday! Just thought I would jump on here and say hello. And I'm going to type in the comments. Uh, let me know where you are watching from. How's everyone doing today? It's, it's a crazy, uh, crazy month. It's going to be a crazy week next week. So I'm sort of gearing up for that. Uh, we had probably our busiest month just on a flurry of different shoots, doing all kinds of different things with uh, different guests. <laughs> nice. Uh, let me know where you're watching from. I'm just here to answer your questions. To try and tell you a little bit about what I know a little bit about, which is for those of you who are new, I am a former Universal Pictures home entertainment brand marketing and strategy guy. I worked for the studios for a long time. Before that, working through college, I was in action sports. That's why I still love skateboards and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and now I have a production company where it's really focused on telling original stories using digital video and all the latest tools uh, I create commercials, like things you might see on TV or the internet. And I also do documentary films, as well as this channel, which is Behind the Brand, uh, a show about innovators, entrepreneurs, and the stories behind their success. Get it? Behind the success? Uh, and the whole point of the show is to help give you guys knowledge to level up or get inspired or accomplish the things that you want to do to grow your business, to grow your channel if you're a creator. Uh, yes, Leo, thanks. We're so close to 200K. <laughs> yeah, it's been a, you know, if there's like a chart, ours is just like the tortoise's race, slow and steady. And hopefully slow and steady wins the race. We'll see. But uh, it's been a decade. Well, a decade plus two, actually. So we're in it for the long haul. We're not going anywhere. No plans to quit. We've been experimenting with lots of different things. Uh, so weigh in on the questions. Let me know where you're watching from. I'm in Los Angeles. It's a beautiful day. We've had Santa Ana winds kind of heavy the last couple of days, which has caused some fires, but we are kind of far enough, far enough away from all that, that we had no evacuation issues, which was nice. Other people were not so lucky. Some of my friends did have to evacuate, but, um, all is well. And it's a beautiful Friday. Tomorrow's Halloween. That's it's also kind of a weird Halloween because uh, I don't think we're going out anywhere or doing anything. I think we're just gonna chill. It's sort of awkward even to hand out candy, although we may do it in like little individual baggies so people don't have to like community grab into a bucket or something like that. We're gonna figure it out. But uh, let me know where you're watching from, and let me know what questions you've got that you'd like to ask me about brand marketing, advertising, strategy. YouTube creation videos, YouTube in general, uh, growth hacking or audience development uh, or video production. If you want to know what cameras I'm using, lights, microphones, you know, gimbals, skateboards, I'm happy to answer the questions that you want to know to help you grow your business. Because this, this channel has always been for you guys. This has never been a platform for me to, you know, just give my opinion or, you know, grow whatever, you know, uh, into something that will push products on you. I don't have any products to sell. Uh, all my content on here is free, accessible, and hopefully the value prop that I'm bringing is like people like Seth Godin, for example, you literally, you'd have to like either fly out to New York or someplace where he's speaking, buy an expensive uh, event ticket, or you'd have to sign up for one of his, um, workshops or seminars, which are fantastic, by the way, they're just like three or $4,000. And so the value prop is really to bring those people to you into your backyard to make them accessible and have them, you know, have you be able to have the ability to sit down at the feet of the master, whoever she is, and listen to what she has to say and learn from, you know, her business experience and hopefully improve what you're doing. So 
Uh, let me check out some of the comments here. Let's see. This light is a little bright. Turn this light down. There we go. That's better. Uh, Richmond, Virginia in the house. Hi from New York City. Nice. Uh, I have friends in Virginia. I have friends in New York. Actually, I have family in New York. London in the house. Welcome. Uh, what's up from Barcelona? Nice. I would love to go to Barcelona someday. I've heard great things. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. My channel's about to blow up. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I felt that way since about 2008. So let's keep the faith. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hi from India. Hi back. India, another interesting place that I would like to go. Um, thanks, Leo. It has been long enough. I... I appreciate those kind words. Uh, Leo wants to know, how did I get into YouTube and how are you so successful? Well, that's very nice of you to say. Uh, for those of you who have heard the story before, I apologize. But for Leo and anyone else who's new, um, I, was, I was at the studios. I was at Universal Pictures. I was uh, able to kind of get some exposure to production. So this was a time when uh, people were buying movies on DVD and we had to sort of come up with additional video footage or value to put on the DVD. And so we thought about things like uh, director's commentary or, you know, uh, bloopers, alternative endings, things like that. We ended up putting them on the movies. Well, in order to do that, we, our division needed to go in and get the footage. So we sat down with, you know, directors like Steven Soderbergh or Jay Roche, who did like movies like Meet the Parents or Steven Spielberg, who at the time was working on a movie. Uh, I think it was AI he was working on at the time. But also there was like the 25th anniversary of E.T. that was coming up at the time, I remember, and Jaws. And so uh, I got to go in the studio with some cool people, Robert De Niro, Ben Stiller, um, Jim Carrey. We were doing The Grinch at the time. And I really got the bug. I was like, oh, man, I, I love this stuff. I love being on camera or behind the camera. And I felt like I was directing. And then I had this experience where I got to fly out to uh, New York to meet with Ron Howard because we had some approvals. And um, he was approving The Grinch. It was cool because he was also casting at that time for a movie called A Beautiful Mind with Russell Crowe, which is also kind of a cool movie. And... Uh, Ron doesn't know it probably, but he really inspired me with some really simple advice because I kind of told him that I had imposter syndrome and that I didn't really feel qualified to, you know, jump out and do my own thing. This was, you know, keep in mind, this is like 2007 before, you know, the word entrepreneur was even buzzy or even on the radar. And he just told me, he goes, you know, everything I've done in my career, people told me I couldn't do it. You know, you're not a good enough actor. You're not a good enough director. And everyone's going to tell you no, most likely. And so uh, that can also be your signal to do the opposite. So uh, especially if you feel like you've got the chops to do it. And I, I did. I feel like felt like I was qualified or rather I felt like I was capable but not qualified or someone didn't grant me a license or permission. So Ron's simple little nudge um, really inspired me to, to take a leap. And then the other signal for me was YouTube. So in 2005 two years prior when YouTube uh, launched, I felt like that was the democratization of the internet or of, you know, video. Like you didn't have to be JJ Abrams to put up a YouTube channel. You could be me and just go for it. And so all these little signals along the way helped kind of nudge me in the right direction. And finally I cut the cord in, in uh, 2008 and started my production company. And then the great recession hit. It was a really hard time. I got punched right in the mouth. All of my best laid plans were wiped out like that. Um, I had clients lined up. I had projects lined up. I had budget committed. All of it went away just like that. And so I, in my moment of panic, because, you know, I was, um, you know, we were, we were a young family. We had three little kids at the time. Now we have four. But at that, that time, you know, my wife was, was not working. She was basically, you know, the caregiver and I was the breadwinner. And uh, we really felt like we were hosed. We lost all of our health insurance and, you know, it was just a really tough time. Uh, and so I decided, all right, I need to invent the solution to my problem. What can I do to fix this? And so I thought, all right, well, 
I feel disconnected from people and inspiration and resources and ideas. I'm literally going to create a show about how to be successful because I need to know that right now. So I thought, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to call this show behind the brand. It's going to be a show about innovators, entrepreneurs, and the stories behind their success so that I can learn how they did it and be successful too, just like them. And so I started out on this path and started reaching out to people that I thought knew what they were talking about. People like Gary Vaynerchuk or Seth Godin or Malcolm Gladwell or Mark Cuban, or, you know, the list goes on on some of those early interviews. Um, and it's funny because one of the early YouTubers I talked to was Justine, you know, I Justine, and she was amazing. But it's funny to look back 10 years now at those interviews, just at the style change, you know, like my hair was weird. Her hair was up big and kind of, you know, it's like we've all sort of evolved. I haven't evolved that much, but she has. Um, and she's an amazing YouTuber who's also been like one of the OGs who I respect and uh, think that she's terrific. But it's just kind of fun to walk back through down memory lane uh, to see how far we've come in a short time, but also a long time. And also to reflect on how we're really just getting started with this. I mean, I'm just really now figuring out uh, how to do this, you know, what I want to do. And it's, I mean, it's a labor of love, yes, but it's become such an important integral part of my overall business strategy too. This show has just been incredible in so many ways, but that's the medium long version of the story. Um, thanks for asking, Leo. All right, if you're just tuning in, let me know where you're watching from. I'm in beautiful Los Angeles. It's Friday, October 30th. Can't believe it. Tomorrow's Halloween. Let me know where you're watching from. And also, uh, let me know what questions you've got. I'm talking a little bit about uh, what I know a little bit about, brand strategy, advertising, YouTube, creator stuff, and the likes. Let me try and pick out some more uh, questions here. Let's see. Um, so a question here is how to find a niche business idea and how to be passionate about it. Okay. Let me start by answering this the way I've answered other questions like this in the past. I think it bears repeating because, you know, it's a tried and true uh, process or exercise. So, you know, I've said a lot on this channel about what I've learned from Seth Godin in particular about this topic. And he always reminds me that maybe, uh, well, oftentimes we as marketers or just people with ideas, we do things out of order. In other words, there is there is a correct order of operations for things. So like you're asking the question, how do I find a niche business idea? How to be passionate about it? So what I would do is I would really try and find an, an interesting problem that needs to be solved. That's what I would do first. So how do you find a niche business? Find an interesting problem that needs to be solved first. Once you find the interesting problem, make sure it's attached to people who want that problem solved, right? It sort of goes hand in hand. Um, and so let's take Uber or Lyft as an example, right? Um, they're in the news a lot, especially in California, because we're about to vote on whether or not they are um, independent contractors or employees of the rideshare companies. But let's look at the look. Let's look at the idea of rideshare to, to begin with. Um, is it a business that solved a problem that wasn't there? You could argue no. You know, taxis have been around for you know since the beginning of time. So it, this wasn't really about replacing the taxi. This, you know, well, what do you think it was? I'll, I'll put it out to the audience. What do you think? Uh, what interesting problem do you think the rideshare companies solve? I think they solve convenience. I think it's a time saver. So, you know, before you have to, you'd have to hail a cab or, I mean, you'd have to maybe even have taxi cabs in your area. If you live in like a uh, rural area, you might not have taxi cabs. You might have to call on the phone in the old days, look it up in the yellow pages, whatever. Um, and maybe they wouldn't even want to come out to your little place. But, uh, Rideshare's changed everything. It's convenient, right? We've got our phones and we could just open up the app and, you know, it's like ordering our food now. It's the same idea. It's about convenience. It's about um, efficiency, time saving and, and all that. And so that is the problem that they solved. 
turns out there's a ton of people that really wanted that, that were sick of waiting for taxi cabs or didn't even have taxis in their area. And that's a way to, you know, find something that's really niche and great, even though it was um, not so obviously niche, right? Because the taxi cabs are already there. So the challenge is to find interesting problems to solve and then to make sure that you have people attached who really want that problem solved. And then Viola, um, that's the first step and the correct order of operations, I think. I hope that helps. James is watching from Kenya. Thank you, James. Andrew from Indiana, awesome. Two places I haven't been, uh, but sound awesome. Let's see, what other questions do you want to know? Uh, let's see, here's a question. What crazy ideas do you have that you would love to do and you haven't done yet because you think they are too crazy? Hmm. Well, it's funny. I'm, I'm always experimenting. And um, the thing about that is, you know, who's to say it's a crazy idea? The interview with Seth, I think, again, I go back to Seth because he's like in my back pocket all the time. He brought up this idea of, uh, you know, someone came to him and said, you know, the reason I'm not doing anything right now is because I'm waiting for that really one crazy idea or great idea. Um, and he said, oh, you mean like, you know, uh, writing a musical about an obscure political figure from the beginning of the foundation of this country that's an musical that's really all put to rap, that's played by actors who are actors of color who you wouldn't expect, you know, there's no like known leading men or no one popular. And it, it, that kind of crazy idea, you know, and, you know, that idea is Hamilton, right? Like the most successful Broadway show to date. Uh, on paper, it does not look like a great idea. Um, it's maybe a crazy idea of Lynn manuel uh, but you know, who would have thought that that would have turned into a great idea? So the word crazy triggers me a little bit because I want to make sure that, you know, you might think you have a crazy idea, but it might not be that crazy at all. It might just be a really normal, amazing idea. So there's a lot of things not as, uh, out there as Hamilton that I want to do, although maybe I should be thinking like that. Um, I'm thinking about documentary films that I want to do. I'm, I'm working on my, you know, a, a little personal project of a doc film based on uh, some of my personal experience as an adoptee. So that's, that's a project that's totally out of the genre that I'm used to dealing in, which, which is business and putting myself out of my comfort zone into more of a, you know, a different genre, let's say. I hope that answers it. Sorry for that long-winded answer. Uh, Andrew uh, suggests that I have multiple streams of income. Is it true? Yes, I do. So um, one stream of income is my production company, and that's really my bread and butter. So I am a writer, director, producer. Um, sometimes my production company will get hired you know, by a brand or by an individual to come and do a project. I live in project world. That's part of the challenge and the opportunity. That's There's pluses and minuses that go with, you know, having that kind of business model. But yeah, basically on a day-to-day -day basis, um, I am either making content for someone else or making it for myself. So on the commercial side, we get paid by clients um, to do commercial stuff. I might get just hired as a solo director to come, you know, you know I get hired by, an agency or someone else's production company and I step in as a director and I direct their commercial or, or something else. Um, this, this channel is a revenue stream, uh, you know, and it, we're independent. We've been fiercely independent. And so some of you have been um, donating to the channel either through the, you know, super chats or, you know, the other uh, things that you've been donating. And I appreciate every single cent of that because it helps me continue to create great content here for you guys. It's not cheap. Um, and in the beginning, I had a very different vision of what it is now. Like in the beginning, I thought, all right, you know, we're going to do this as a pro bono exercise, you know, do it for free and offer, you know, all this access. And then I dreamed that something great was happening that, you know, CNN would come and, you know, buy the show or, you know, uh, at the time we were doing it, like YouTube was giving out money. 
uh, to creators to produce things. They're giving big money, half a million dollars, million dollars to people like Tony Hawk or Rain Wilson um, and a lot of different creators to create shows. And I, th I had a pipe dream that maybe something like that would happen to us. Never happened. So we've just had to sort of grind it out uh, day in and day out and find our way. And the nice thing is that we found an audience. Uh, my message, you know, I've talked about this a lot, like minimum viable audience. I really believe that. And it's, it's so nice, actually. It's comforting to know that I don't need to have Mr. Beast's 40 million or 50 million subscribers to do what I need to do. Would I love to have that many subscribers? Absolutely. But that's not my reality right now. You know, I'm working towards a bigger number, but the optics don't matter to me that much. Um, what matters is that I'm making an impact at this level. You know, there's 33 people on this live stream right now, and that's perfectly fine with me. That definitely falls within my minimum viable audience. And so I'd encourage you to think like that too for your business. Like, what is your minimum viable product? What's your minimum viable audience? Um, let me know if you need me to elaborate on what the MVA is or the MVP. I'm happy to do so. But, but basically, um, this channel now has enough subscribers and enough views to attract quality sponsors. Um, and that's another stream of revenue that's certainly great in addition to the AdSense revenue and, and any donations that you guys make to the channel. Um, please do not feel obligated to donate at all. I'm doing this... Um, I'm doing this with or without you kind of sounds abrupt, but it's true. Like I hope to give a gift because, you know, 10 years ago when I started this, I was really desperate and uh, terrified actually <laughs> about how or whether or not my business would survive. And now this show has become a way to give back, but let's also face it. Uh, there's a lot in it for me. So to be able to align me, you know, as a, as a director with, you know, big names is it totally helps my cause too. Right. So that's, that's my selfish endeavor too. Like all that helps me raise my profile, give me access to bigger and better people. I also have a syndication partnership with several magazines. Um, Inc magazine is, you know, one of my main partners, fast company magazine uh, off the record. If you can keep it a secret, I don't tell anyone on the internet. We're talking to Forbes right now. We'll see what happens. We're, we're sort of going back and forth on what the deal is, but um yeah, I like to to have multiple streams of revenue because you never know, you know, who's going to shut the switch off and what switch is going to turn on. And um, so we're doing all that. Um, I also, you know, have other businesses that I'm investing in and other things that I'm trying. Uh, lots of boats in the water. You never know which one's going to be ready to sail. And so, yeah, that's me. And, and I would offer the same advice. You know, you've got to do multiple things, I think, as contingency plans because, you know, best laid plans always change. And so that's, that's just the way I do it. Cool. Keep the questions coming. If you're just tuning in, uh, we are talking about a little bit of something about I, what I know a little bit about, which is brand marketing strategy, uh, YouTube growth. If you're a creator, I'm happy to weigh in and tell you some of my experience. Um, I shared a video recently that one of my videos got uh, just a few thousand views. Then we did some tweaking on the back end and it ended up going viral and getting, you know, now it has close to 2 million views. And that video alone has netted, well, the gross number is probably close to $40,000 now. So the net number is what, about 30? So yeah, that one video, and I have 600 videos, has netted like $30,000. So it's, you can make money on YouTube if you figure out how to do it. Um, but I'm happy to answer any questions for you. And also let me know where you're watching from. I'm in Los Angeles. Uh, we have lots of folks from all over the world, it looks like. Um, let's see. Look at the uh, high from Colorado. Hi, David. How are you doing? My son is in Boulder, so I have a special place for Colorado in my heart. <laughs> Thank you, Leo, for the kind words. Appreciate that. Um, what if I'm, okay, so Life with Lolo asks, what if I'm interested in multiple things, but yet I want to start a business? So, Lolo, I think that's great that you want, you're interested in several things. Um, let me see. I'm trying to give you really useful advice. Um, 
without being repetitive. So in my experience, I have found that there are multiple right answers. Like, so let's say you have three things that you want to do. Um, they might all be great ideas and might take you down three different paths, but might be equally great. So my advice is, you know, try them on for size. Like you literally have to get, you know, put the shirt on the pants on to see if they fit right and then wear them around and do stuff. And I think you'll get a really good sense of whether or not they fit, right? That's how it kind of works out. So my advice for you, if you have multiple things that you're interested in, try them on for size. The other qualifier to that is that I have had the most success at this intersection, which is the intersection of things that I'm really interested in, things that I love, and things that I'm good at. Does that make sense? So when I'm interested and I'm great at this, um, let's say it's soccer because I love soccer. Uh, I play pickup soccer with a bunch of people, at least I did before the pandemic. And um, I love soccer and I'm, I'm relatively decent at it. And so, you know, good things happen. So if you can make a business out of something that you love and that you're good at, the money will follow. You don't have to worry about, you know, fame and, uh, you know, respect and money will always follow the talent. And if you're great at it, then you'll be able to be consistent. And you'll keep doing it. If you are great at it, but you hate it, you'll be miserable. And I've done that too. Like I've been really good at things, but I've stayed in something way too long that, because it didn't make me happy. It made me a lot of money, but it didn't make me happy. And so that's my advice to you. Try it on for size. Um, and of course, you know, back to my other advice about making sure that there's an audience. You may have this great idea, something you're interested in, but is there really demand for it? A lot of us, you know, go out and will create something without knowing whether or not there's an audience. And that's fine if you love creating, but just don't have the expectation that anyone's going to pay attention to it. I think the smarter approach is to discover what people need first, going back to that, you know, solving interesting problems advice. Find where there's a hole in the market, white space, a problem that needs to be solved, a way to delight people, make them happy, change their life, you know, whatever that is. Find the audience first and then create the solution. And that's kind of what I did with this show. On a very micro level, um, my minimum viable audience was me. <laughs> so I needed to know this stuff right away. So I created the show for one person, me. And, uh, and that was enough. And so it turned out that a lot of people also were in the same boat as me. And so that's why the show took off. Um, so make sure you have an audience, figure out the minimum viable product or minimum viable audience, and you'll probably have wild success. Hope that helps. Uh, let's see. Keep the questions coming. Let me know where you're watching from. I'm in Los Angeles. It's a beautiful Friday. Let's see. Uh, what's, the question here is, what skills do you need as a content creator and copywriter? and how to develop them. You're gonna to wanna to watch the last video I just made with Seth Godin. I'll try and pull it up here and give you the link. Let's see if I can get to my own channel. Seth Godin, if you don't know who he is, he is you know, one of the most prolific writers uh, of our time. He has 20 best-selling books out. He's amazing. He also happens to be a mentor and a friend and this video that we just did, I just dropped the link here for you, is fantastic for anyone who wants to create or write. But basically his advice to summarize, uh, in case you don't want to watch the video, he said to get better at writing or copywriting, you just have to do it. And uh, do it often and consistency. So it's hard to like sit down and say, I'm going to write a masterpiece. Because it probably won't happen, <laughs> you know. But... Um, there's, I've talked about this before. Uh, so I spent time in Japan. One of my famous Japanese, favorite Japanese proverbs is chidi o tsumoriba yamoto naru. Chidi o tsumoriba yamoto naru. It means if you pile up enough dust, you can make a mountain. And so the idea here is if you're writing just a little bit every day, copywriting, creating, making a video, the first hundred might be terrible, but that's okay. You need, 
you need to get through that learning curve to get to the next phase, which is not terrible. <laughs> that could be good, great, or a masterpiece. And so my best advice is for you to, to just do the work, to practice. That's the title of Seth's new book. I think it's super valuable advice. Practice, 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 practice. And you will become better. Um, the other thing to do is get feedback. Seek feedback from people that you trust. Or if you're courageous, you can put your work out there in the market to be criticized and critiqued by strangers. Um, if you ever want to get depressed, just head to the YouTube comments. <laughs> Fortunately, my channel is pretty uh, gentle, which is nice. I appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for your mostly uh, in, you know, like uh, words of encouragement and and that's nice. But sometimes, you know, you get some really weird comments. And so, you know, when you put your work out there, that's what you're saying is you're saying, here, I made this and it's open for you to comment on and critique the way you want. So uh, I would say to get better is to, to, to practice. Um, Reading Stars asks, what is the best way to promote your business? Mm, that's a loaded question. Not a bad one, but... Um, there's a lot of possible answers. I would start back at the basics, trying to figure out who it's for and what it's for. When you know what it's for, what your goal is, what do you want to accomplish? Not like what the topic is, because that's more of a function of uh, once you know who you're talking to. Again, going back to that problem solving. But when you focus on who it's for, then you know or might know or might go through the exercise of finding out where these people hang out to promote it. So let's say uh, you want to reach a bunch of college students. And sure, we all know, you know, college people are on Snapchat, Instagram, TikTok, whatever, fine. But maybe they also hang out at Starbucks, right, or the local coffee shop. So a way to promote your business might be to reverse engineer who you're talking to and where they hang out. And then go hang out there with them. And I think that's, to me, the most logical way to promote a business. Um, assuming that you already have something that they want and you've done the due diligence to figure that out. So I hope that helps. Um, thank you for your comments. Continue to let me know where you're watching from. I'm in LA. And drop your questions here. I should do my best to... Just trying to spend a little time with you guys. Wow, the time really flies here. I love it. But we've been jamming now for a little while. Let's see. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Peter says, yes, Seth is legit. I agree. Do you plan on doing a podcast? Ah, James, you probably don't know. I already have a podcast by the same name. So wherever you listen to podcasts, Spotify, iTunes, um, SoundCloud, Google, just search behind the brand with Brian Elliott and you will find the podcast. I have, to be honest, I have um, not been as active. I have, you know, probably 600 episodes in the can. And I, I think I've only released about 100 there on the podcast so far because I'm also dabbling with this idea of adding sort of more commentary to it. Like, call it, you know, Brian's take. So like, here's what Seth said, which is incredible and, and awesome. But then like my take, which is, okay, you just heard Seth. Here's what you really should pay attention to, or like, here's my take. And so I'm, I'm experimenting with that uh, possibility. Excuse me why I put on Chapstick. By the way, a little fun fact about me. This is not a sponsored ad for Chapstick, but I cannot live without this stuff, especially on a, a, rain, a windy day. It's like my go-to. So if anyone who knows me well um, knows that I always have chapstick in my pocket. Anyway. Yes, I did just drink water after applying chapstick on my lips. I'm okay with that. I'm used to it. I need to hydrate, though. Um, my friend from Germany asked, uh, tell me how you felt when you crossed 100,000. Well, you can you, know, you can see my play button back here, and it was a great accomplishment. If I, I'll be totally honest, um, I I was excited and happy, 
but I felt like uh, I don't want this to seem braggy or um, terrible, but I I feel like this channel is really undersubscribed. I'm totally biased. I get that, but like you know, I see other channels out there that are just like in the stratosphere with either the same content or you know not as good as what I'm putting out, and they've got you know gazillions of subscribers. The YouTube algorithm has not been good to us. Like we were way early on long form when long form was not being rewarded by the algorithm. Uh, it is now like watch time is a key metric, but in the beginning subscribers and views was the metric. And so uh, if you put out like I did, like a 30 minute video with Tim Ferriss in 2011, YouTube totally throttled our growth. You know, like not a lot of people saw that and it was gold. And this was before Tim even started the Tim Ferriss podcast, which is now, you know, like one of the top podcasts in the world. Um, I just feel like we were too early in many ways. And also, you know, I, I'll take responsibility. I haven't been as consistent on YouTube as maybe other creators have, which has led to their explosive growth and not to diminish or take away from the talent of some of these other YouTubers. I mean, look at what Casey Neistat has done. Look at what Jimmy, you know, Mr. Beast has done. Look at what Justine has done. Um, these are all people who have just like stayed on the button and they, they're tremendous and I admire them. And, you know, I'm also learning from them, but at the same time, I feel like, you know, other business channels in the space, um, I've got, I can go toe to toe with them and I've got, you know, just 10% of the subscribers that they do. So it's a little bittersweet, you know, great milestone, but like, I really feel like, we have a long ways to go before I'm satisfied or happy. And anyway, that's the truth. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Now I've started to feel like the sub number is nothing special. Yeah. Uh, you know, as a follow up to that, if you're chasing the numbers, you know, you're going to be chasing your shadow. It's a tough thing. So, you know, my advice is not pay attention to the optics Pay attention to your audience and and pay attention to your heart. You know, like um, there's a fine line between listening to what you guys want and what I want to do. And hopefully it's a collaboration between us. You know, like I definitely love feedback. I want to know what you want to know. Uh, that's really important to me. But also like I have a vision of where I want to take the show. It's the vision of where I started, but also, you know, it's been evolving. And so hopefully you guys are vibing on that. You're loving it. And we'll continue to give me feedback and it will be this collaborative, you know, project where we can both benefit um, that you love the content and I love creating it. So uh, Pete wants to know who's my soccer team. Um, unfortunately, the USA, I'm sorry to say, is still in, you know, in its development years. Uh, we're coming along, but, you know, it's, U.S. soccer is what, only 30 years old, maybe? Uh, where like English, Premier, Spanish, Mexico, all parts of Europe, Asia, Africa, these guys are like, you know, born with a soccer ball in their crib from like early, early on, a couple hundred years. And so uh, we have a long way to go. My team, I love Liverpool. Uh, Liverpool has always been my team, like since the Steven Gerrard days. And I've always been a Liverpool fan and, and followed them through the ups and the downs. We're having some great success, you know, lately. Uh, but I was a fan way back when we weren't having as much success when uh, Manchester United was crushing us and, and winning everything. Or, um, And, of course, I respect all the other players. I love Messi and Ronaldo and, you know, all the all the great players. So big soccer fan. I'm also a big American football fan, big baseball fan. Dodgers in my town just won the World Series, so I'm super psyched. Uh, you can see the Dodger hat here behind me. I was born in Los Angeles. I'm one of the very few people in LA, it seems, that are from LA. Uh, born and raised in LA. I'm in uh, more of a coastal town now, but um, I'm still in Southern California, so I root for the Dodgers. I like the Angels, too. I think Mike Trout is a fantastic player, underrated. Um, I wish he could have more success on the Angels, but, you know. Uh, if you're just tuning in, let me know where you're watching from. I'm loving all these questions. Keep them coming. Boise, Idaho in the house. Thank you. Watching from Panama City, Panama. Awesome. Let's see. 
Watching from Saudi Arabia. Awesome. Thank you. You also do a video about computer science. Love it. How can I improve myself? Uh, Muhammad asks, how can I improve myself? Um, also a loaded question with lots of answers. Muhammad, I think this is a great question. It's a question I ask myself every single day. Uh, I'm reading a book right now. I'll share with you. Let's see. Where is it? I love this book, uh, if you can see it. Uh, it's called Atomic Habits, and it's written by an author named James Clear. And, Muhammad, I'll answer your question by what I've learned in the book so far. Um, how to improve yourself. It's um, result-oriented goals are not that great. For example, like, you know, I want to lose weight, or, or I want to lose 10 pounds, or um, uh, I want to run a marathon. These are result-oriented goals. And James suggests that real change, real habits stick when we change our identity. So, for example, um, for health reasons, I was getting headaches a lot, and I realized that, tri uh, that sugar was triggering the headaches, making me sick. You know, like, I love donuts. I love ice cream, candy. I used to eat lots of it. And then, like, five years ago, it started giving me a really bad headache. And so I had to quit eating the sweets. It kills me but I feel much better. So um, I literally changed my identity as, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a dessert eater. Like that was my identity. I changed from result oriented to more identity based. And that made all the difference. You know, like uh, I also don't drink alcohol. I, you know, I never have, I've always been an athlete trying to stay healthy. Um, some of you know that my dad did not have really great health and that I lost him last year. Uh, because of some complications through a surgery that he had, which was sort of routine. That was devastating to me. So I've watched um, my dad and others have bad health, and I've wanted to do it differently. And so I have literally tried to become someone different um, and change that way. And so my advice to you, Muhammad, is you know how to improve yourself. You do it a little bit at a time. Small, incremental change is what makes you all it makes all the difference and you do it consistently. And so that's what atomic means. It's atomic means a small. Um, it's the same way metaphorically that you would eat, you know, a giant meal, like little tiny bites at a time or how you take, you know, the journey of a thousand steps starts with the very first step is the same kind of premise. Um, trying to be a little bit better today than you were yesterday. That's how you improve yourself. That's how you become a better person. And I think it also, you know, is worth saying that we can focus on the things that, that really matter. Yeah. Like, uh, fitness matters and eating healthier matters, but also some of these more abstract things like trying to be a little bit kinder to other people and yourself. You know, I'm my own worst critic. I wake up in the morning and I think, Oh geez, you know, there's not this guy again, but that's not good. That's not healthy. You know, be kind to yourself, love yourself, love others, be more, you know, generous, uh, with your time or your attention. Um, I'm trying to put, you know, walk the walk here by trying to, you know, be here for you guys, engage. I love it. Um, but also I'm trying to give back. It's, it's, I think it's important to focus on those, those things because um, all of them wrapped together. Again, this Chidi Otsumoto Yamato Naru idea, pile of enough dust, you can make the mountain. I think, you know, you become a better person. And we're all, I think, in a state of becoming. Um, the choices that we make either put us on this path to improvement or the opposite, right? Like if we make poor decisions, if I, you know, eat a donut this afternoon or five donuts or whatever, whatever I'm capable of, um, I will become worse. There's no standing still because the, you know, the earth is moving. And if you're just standing still, you're losing ground. Like, so you got to either becoming in the process of becoming better or by default, you're becoming worse. Hope that philosophy stands up for you guys. Let me know what you think. Uh, more questions. Missouri in the house. Um, how do you figure out what should someone start with? How to know what you're good at? Okay. Uh, you know, it's a similar question asked in a different way, but, um, and I'm sorry, I can't pronounce your name. I, I don't even want to try because it's a very long name. I'm sure it's beautiful in your language, but I I'm not familiar. So I'll just try to answer your question by saying uh, what I said earlier to Lolo, I think it was, you have to try a lot of things on 
for size, things that you are drawn to. Like, you know, um, I love dogs. I love dogs so much. Um, you know, they're a big part of my life. They help me tremendously. And so I could see myself, let's say, you know, put all this production stuff or commercial work or any everything else to the side. I could seriously consider a career somehow working with dogs, whether that's uh, uh, becoming a dog doctor, a veterinarian, or caring for dogs, having like a shelter, a no-kill shelter, maybe having a farm, a place where, you know, lost or abandoned dogs could come stay and live, you know, a healthy, happy life. Um, I could see, you know, maybe being a dog trainer, a coach. So, you know, whatever you're drawn to, whatever you think that you might love, I think that's a good place to start. And then you try it on for size and see if it fits. And if it doesn't fit, take it off and try something new out. So it is a bit of a process of elimination. Um, but I think that's where I would start. And I hope, I wish you all the best luck and success in that. Yes, chapstick is addicting. Thanks, Pete. Yeah. Do you have any children and are they also successful? Yes, I do have children. I have four children. And um, yeah, they are successful. I think they are still a work in progress, just like all of us. But yeah, they are. I mean, I'm, it's interesting, right? Like, so in one sense, the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. Uh, and yet they are all each, all four of them, unique individual people with their own sort of baked in um, hard wiring and personalities. So I'm, I'm here to sort of give them advice when they want it to help, you know, keep them alive, uh, and safe, but also to let them, uh, do their own thing, spread their wings and figure out what they want to do. And, uh, so I'm excited to see where that goes. The jury is still out, so they're still young and we don't know, but, uh, yeah, I would say that they're successful so far in what they're doing. Um, Let's see. Is my income 80% of YouTube? No. Um, YouTube is probably 25% of my income, and my production company business is probably 75-ish. Let's see. More questions, more questions. How long does it take for me to create a video and publish it? Oh, that's a good question. Sometimes it's quick, uh, like 24 to 48 hours. It's like I'm super inspired to do it. I turn the camera on and I go. And other times it's like weeks uh, of planning or like I shoot it and it sits, you know, in the hard drive for a couple of weeks and then I get to it. Like I have a queue. I, it's somewhat disorganized. I have to admit, um, sometimes based on, you know, how I'm feeling that week. Cheers, wherever you are. Sometimes it's like what I'm in the mood to do. Sometimes I like I have my finger on the pulse and I feel like you guys want to hear a certain video before another video that I had planned. And so I bumped that to the front. I did that with Chris Voss. Have you seen the Chris Voss uh, video? I think it's great. Chris is amazing. <laughs> and tell me if I'm wrong, but Chris, doesn't Chris sound like um, Al Pacino? Do you know who Al Pacino is, actor Al Pacino? Whoa, scent of a woman, you know, that <laughs> he has that deep growly voice. I I was tempted to ask him to give me a hoo but I didn't. But Chris was brilliant, and uh, and I put that video up front before some of the others just because I thought that you guys would enjoy it. It's all about negotiation. Sorry, the like the art of the deal. It's really dry here because of the Santa Ana winds. Um, but yeah, he, he talks about negotiation tips and strategies and how to get the best deal. I thought it was really great. I enjoyed it. Um, a couple of the questions and then I got to get going because I have another thing to edit. Uh, do I have any more tips, Paul asks, on being in front of the camera? I'm more comfortable with the script, but it comes across, yeah, uh, predictable. And, and yeah, so, Paul, this is, uh, this is not, you know, you're, you're not alone, okay? So I feel you on this. Very relatable question. 
being in front of the camera is not easy. Well, to everyone, uh, it was not easy for me. I'm someone of an introvert. Um, I'm also kind of selective with my words. I overthink things sometimes. Sometimes I'm not in the mood to be on camera. Sometimes I think I look like I just was in a fight or just woke up. Like there's lots of reasons, excuses for me to say, I don't want to be on camera today. So back to my original advice about practice. Um, I think you can practice being on camera and um, you don't have to publish it. Keep that in mind. Flip the camera on, record, be uh, extemporaneous, spontaneous, talk off script, um, but talk to the camera and record it and just practice. The other tip I have for you is um, teleprompter can work if you get good at the teleprompter, but it still doesn't it feel like your eyes are moving and it sounds like you're reading something. So maybe mem memorization is your best technique. And if you can just memorize little chunks and, and you can see evidence of this in some of the videos that I've done. I've done it well sometimes, I think, and I've done it not so well sometimes, where I have been uh, too reliant on my notes. Let me try and find one here as an example. There's, oh, here's one. Um, here's one where I sort of had a script, like I had a game plan, and then I strayed from the script and talked more from the heart. And I feel like it worked out. And then another time I did that and it didn't work out so well. I looked too much at the monitor and people called me out for it. Like, hey, seems like you're reading. And it's like, yeah, I am. I'm like, this is like a case study video. So I wrote this out. I you know, planned it out for you guys. And now I'm talking about it. But yeah, I would say uh, practice in front of the camera, but also um, memorize little paragraphs, turn the camera on, say it, cut camera, you know, then go on to your next chunk. Rehearse that, memorize it, turn the camera back on and go. So you can do it that way, memorized. Or you, if you feel, if you get comfortable enough or competent enough with the content, you can speak by bullet points. You know, have it up on your phone and like, you know, little prompts to tell you what to say next. And then you can, you know, go off script and talk about it. Not exactly the way you wrote it, but, you know, stay sort of in your outline. Those are my two tips. At least that's what I do. I just think practice, 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 uh, and, and you'll get it. All right. A couple more questions, and I got I to gotta bounce. Let's see. What have I learned about connecting with people from your experience interviewing people from such diverse backgrounds? Mm, this is an excellent question. What have I learned? So much. You know what I've learned? I've learned that people are basically the same wherever you go in the world. People are the same. When something's funny, we laugh. When something is sad or tragic, we cry. Uh, we all want to belong. We all want to find our own sense of identity. We all want to be heard and understood. Um, you know... Cultural differences, language differences, you know, skin color, all of that, in my experience, it all boils down to it doesn't matter. We're all different, and that's wonderful. I'm happy that there's diversity. We need it. It's like the same reason we need um, scientists and musicians and architects and plumbers and video creators and doctors. Like, we need it all because, like, you know, all of one thing, you know, if everyone was just an artist, the world wouldn't be as rich or happy or amazing. We need everybody. And so um, my net assessment for at least this video is that wherever you go, people are fundamentally the same. We're all humans. We're, we all want the same things. We're all in this pursuit of happiness and trying to figure it out. And, um, and I'm just glad to be part of it. Uh, let's see. Moby wants to know, when you do a lot of things, do you recommend niching down in your marketing message? Yes. Uh, niching, you know, finding the niche or the niche is always my best advice. Um, however, that said, sometimes you can A, B test, if you know what that is. In other words, let's say you have, five different products and you don't know which one people are going to like the most, you might put all five out there 
and test it, you know, a B test. What do, what do you like the most? Why do you like it? And then test. And so you might whittle those five things down to three things and then test those. So, you know, do you niche down right away? Sometimes you can't. Sometimes you test five and then you whittle it down to three and then you decide, okay, it's one or two, maybe it's three. I don't know. But um, I think testing is a good way to niche down to figure out, you know, who the winners are. Who knows? You might have five equally strong winners and that would be terrific. Uh, do you have any advice for beginner bloggers? You talk about writing blogging or like vlogging on video. Cause I think it's basically the same idea. It goes back to this idea of practice. Watch that video that I dropped the link down here with Seth Godin on the practice. Um, it's super good. And he gives great advice. He calls me out too, because I, I have a book in progress, the behind the brand book um, that I've been working on for a couple of years now. And he, you know, cracked the whip on me a little bit and said, come on, you got to get with it. You got to finish it. Can't just talk about it. And uh, so I, I would say, watch that video. Let's see. Let's see. I'm going to wrap things up here, guys. I really appreciate you spending some time with me. Um, let me know in the comments what I haven't done, like what you would like to see me do that I haven't done yet. Um, if you're new to the channel, feel free to peruse and see what you like. And um, we'll talk again soon. Have a great weekend. Uh, stay healthy and happy. If you're in the United States, make sure next week to vote. If you haven't, that's super important. Make your voice heard. And uh, signing off, I'll talk to you guys soon.